to our next video in our video series talking about the counterfactual and its importance in research. Today we have Dr. Jared Baton, who is a professor of global health, epidemiology, and medicine at the University of Washington. His research focuses on prevention of HIV and other sexually transmitted diseases, and he also directs the University of Washington Fred Hutch Center for AIDS Research. Welcome, Dr. Baton. Thanks. Great to be here. Dr. Beaton, um, just to set the ball rolling, uh, we want to hear your thoughts. You know, the use of external historical controls have been mentioned as we consider alternative trial designs uh, for new PrEP trials. Uh, can you speak to what these terms mean and uh, what are some of the examples? Happily. Um, and, and I'm really, just to start out, I'm really glad that you're doing these interviews because having and having an open, open and global conversation on how best to do next phase prep trials is incredibly important. Um, because even though we've got great prep products now, we need to have as many great prep products as we'll get every person who wants to use some sort of prep agent to be able to be covered. And the only way to get there is to develop more and more options for people so that people have um, the option that's gonna work best for them. Um, and so let's talk, so you want me to talk about counterfactuals and, and historical controls. So yes. this, the idea here is that if you're testing something that you know, that that's either you're testing something you think is going to work against HIV or in demonstration type settings where counterfactuals have been used already that, um, that you already know is going to work against HIV, that works against, uh, works against HIV acquisition that and you at the same time don't have a parallel population receiving um, placebo as would have been done in in earlier trials you have to use a placebo from the past um, uh, from ideally one that was in the near past so the differences between now and in the past are less mm -hmm. but from that past group of people you can estimate what hiv uh, acquisition uh, rates would have been in the absence of your prevention intervention. <clears throat> so one example of this is something that we've used in studies of, of HIV zero different partnerships. So now more than 10 years ago, uh, the partners prep study was uh, the trial that demonstrated that prep was effective for HIV prevention in heterosexual populations. And that study was done was uh, led by a whole huge team of investigators from, from East Africa, from Uganda and Kenya. And that was a randomized placebo-controlled trial uh, because PrEP, uh, prep th then PrEP as daily oral FTC-TDF was brand new. And so it was FTC-TDF versus placebo and it demonstrated in the background of all kinds of other HIV prevention um, uh, strategies such as counseling and circumcision and STI treatment and uh, partner testing, and it, against that background, PrEP was shown to be effective for HIV prevention. When that study finished, it transitioned into demonstration work, um, and a study was called the uh, Partners Demonstration Project, which enrolled a group of HIV zero different couples who weren't in the original study and were interested in potentially trying PrEP as well as treatment for HIV, uh, for their HIV and for HIV prevention for the partner who was living with HIV. When we did that demonstration study, we could no longer do a placebo control trial. We knew that PrEP worked for HIV, but when we did the demonstration study and everyone was offered PrEP and everyone was offered treatment, at the end of it, we saw very few infections and we thought, how many infections could we have seen if we didn't have these great interventions. And so we went back to the partner's PrEP study data where we had had all kinds of good counseling and risk reduction counseling and circumcision and STI services, but not PrEP. And we said, and, and treatment then at higher, C, uh, treatment then at lower CD4 counts rather than universal treatment, because that was the difference at the time. We said in the absence of PrEP and early treatment, what rate of HIV would we have seen? And we used that 
comparison, that historical comparison from a few years before, but not from that long before, to be able to say, we think it would have been this high, and we saw that HIV rates was, was this high, and they were quite different. Um, in that particular example, in the demonstration project, the HIV incidence was 0.2% per year, quite small. And the expected HIV incidence, what we would have anticipated if we hadn't had those interventions, was just over 5% per year, so a 95, 96% difference. Now, that worked really well for zero different partnerships because we had, uh, we had the information from the same geographic space from Kenya and Uganda in zero different partnerships. And we could quantify what, their, what the transmission risk would have been because there are some pretty clear predictors in couples about the chances of getting HIV. Chances are greater of transmitting HIV if the couple is younger, if they report on protected sex, if they don't have children together, and if the, and if the, uh, the partner who's living with HIV has a higher viral load. And so we could say, okay, let's calculate based on those factors what we think the HIV incidence would be. Let's in the in the demonstration group let's make let's match to make sure that we that match to the, to the historical group to make sure that the distribution of those risk factors is the same so if there's you know a quarter of them have high viral load and a half of them have medium viral load and a quarter of them have low viral load do the same matching in those historical comparisons say okay we've got these matched up to each other in that counterfactual what th would things have looked like so that was really valuable at that time um, when we did the demonstration project for, for showing that in a demonstration setting where we offered everyone PrEP, that PrEP seemed to work extremely well and we could quantify how well it worked. Now you carry that forward to new HIV PrEP trials and do the same thing. You give PrEP of some sort, be it a pill that's every day, a pill that's every week, month, X months, a shot, doesn't matter, they're all PrEP. You give, you give that PrEP um, in the demonstration setting or in, the clinical, or in a clinical trial setting, and you can say, this is, the HIV this is the HIV rate that we're measuring, what could it have been? And you use the best information you've got from a population that's as similar as possible to the population you've got, uh, that you're observing in, in, the, in, the, in the new clinical uh, trial setting to be able to estimate that HIV risk. Thank you so much. That was very clear. So um, just to extend it further, um, in terms of the historical controls, time is not an issue given that we are looking at populations at different time points. But the issue of balancing baseline characteristics is what is of essence you wouldn't say that that may have had an impact? Well, there's a, there's a number of factors you want to consider in doing these, doing these historical comparisons, these counterfactual comparisons. Because what you're trying to do is you're trying to say, if, you're trying to, you're trying to mimic. If we had had, when we're doing our trial and we're giving some sort of prep to a group of people now, if we had done a second trial at the same time where, where we recruited in the exact same way and the exact same people, but we didn't give them PrEP, if we had done that, so you're not doing it, but you're sort of trying to mathematically create that, that hypothetical scenario. If we had done that, then how do we, then we compare the HIV rates between them. The several things factor into that. How do you get a population that is as similar as possible? Part of that is geography. So um, if your current study is being done in Johannesburg and Cape Town, just to pick two cities, you want to try to get HIV incidents from Johannesburg and Cape Town, not from, um, you know, not from the long way you know, or something. So to try to get them as matched as possible. And you want the same kind of, you know, the same characteristics of people. So if your current population is women and, you know, young women and young men, maybe who are like 18 to 25, you want to have historical information that's not from people who are 45 to, to 55. Uh, because those kind of factors can be related to the chances of getting HIV. So you want to match them as closely as you can. 
So you want to match those risk characteristics as much as you can. And some of the risk is, is geography and some of the risk is factors like age. Um, and then one of the real challenges is time does make a difference because H pop, the population chances of HIV in everywhere in the world fluctuate over time. Um, they don't fluctuate, you know, minute to minute, but they fluctuate yeah. over a period of several years. And so one of the one, of course, one of the most wonderful things is as treatment has rolled out in countries like Botswana, for example, there's very good data, um, or Zambia, the HIV incidence in the last decade seems to have been going down and down. So you want to be trying to get information from around that same time. Mm -hmm. um, in some of the some of the examples that we've done, where we've worked with HIV zero different couples, zero different couples, you get around that a little bit because most of the HIV risk is within the partnership, and so the changes that are happening with treat with treatment rollout in communities don't affect the zero different partnership so much unless the person living with HIV is already on treatment before you start. In um, in other types of populations, such as um, um, young women, uh, you can you you would ideally try to use information from as close to the time as possible because these changes in HIV incidence aren't happening, you know, from from first quarter to second quarter of a year. They're happening over years, and so if you can get something from last year, year before, that's really close information. You can have more confidence than if it was information from ten years ago. Mm -hmm. That really addresses the next question that we were going to ask about some of the issues and how do you address those issues, especially with respect to geography, the time, um, all of those baseline characteristics that as, as um, we conduct our, our randomized clinical trials or control trials, how, do, how are you able to guarantee that the two populations are as close as possible? So thank you for, for addressing that. Thanks. I mean, I think just to pull this a little bit further, I think the the one of the important things is so you're trying to match the characteristics as, as closely as you can, and that's very important in terms of time, geography, characteristics of characteristics of the populations, because then you can feel better that your comparison is uh, is one that should be reflecting your the current situation. The other, the other really useful, it, 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 is, it is really useful though to remember that these counterfactuals are never gonna be perfect. And there's no intention that they have to be perfect. What they're trying to do is they're trying to be informative and part of a total package for a new PrEP agent to characterize that it works and that it's safe. It's not the only piece of data, it's part of, and just like even even if there was around even back to FTC TDF ten year ten plus years ago, the ran, the one randomized clinical trial comparison wasn't the only piece of data. There's also safety data and lots of and dozens and dozens of supporting studies that provide the entire regulatory package for a new prep agent. The, a counterfactual for a new prep modality will be part of the total package of information. What it provides, though, that is, that might be really unique in the current day, is it would provide an indication of of the absolute protection that the new prep agent would offer, because right. the way that prep trials are being considered right now often is new is random is a randomized trial, often blinded, of new prep agent compared to old prep agent, and that's totally standard. That's exactly what people do for trials of depression or heart disease or anything else. They compare the new thing to old thing and show that new thing is at least as good as old thing or maybe or maybe even better for various reasons. And for PrEP, it's mo for PrEP, the, the reason it can be better is mostly about um, is mostly about adherence because new PrEP agents are being optimized for better adherence. Um, with some with some um, hints of things that might be better in terms of some um, tolerability and side effects and other things. The new prep agent and old prep agent, if can be new prep agent can be quite successful in one of those trials if it protects equally well to old prep agent. It can be and that will be a success in one of these new trials. But the counterfactual allows you to say, Okay, how much does it how much does it really protect 
how much does it really protect? So you can imagine doing a, you can imagine doing a bang up PrEP trial right now where there'd be almost no HIV infections in both the old PrEP are a randomized group, so maybe who would get the FTCDF daily pills, and a new PrEP group, who yeah. shot or something else, and you'd have almost no HIV infections. Both of them are clearly successful, and someone could come back and say, but really, how well does it work? And you use the counterfactual to say, in the absence yes. of any type of PrEP, either yeah. old or new, you should have had this many infections and you saw this. And so it looks like it works this well, and you get that from the counterfactual. Right. Thank you so much. That's perfect. Uh, you kind of already started answering my next question, which is really to understand then, uh, will this be then the only way uh, or the only path forward using an alternative design instead of a traditional superiority or an inferiority trial design in this current context? Yeah. So I, I think there are lots of paths forward for different, I think there are still lots of paths forward for different PrEP agents. And I think one thing that I've been trying to say for the last few years is to, for people not to be discouraged about the ability to do good clinical research to develop new PrEP products. Um, it's good. It requires all of us thinking about better study designs and better statistical analyses, but there are tons of, there are tons of pathways to new prep agent success. Sometimes those are going to be superiority trials. So they, and, they, and, and as you know, out there, there are both superiority and non-inferiority trials. And those are basically testing against old prep agent, old prep agent, you know, a daily oral FTC TDF pill, the new prep, be it FTC TAF or a shot or whatever's coming in the future, whether those are equivalent to each other, non-inferiority, essentially equivalent to each other, non-inferiority, or superior and superior solely based on better adherence, because we know that we know very well that the daily pills are incredibly highly protective when taken very well. So both superiority and non-inferiority trials can be used, can be done for a new PrEP agent. And both of them can use the counterfactual to estimate in the absence of PrEP how well this thing really worked. And how well this thing really worked is really important, I think, for, for prescribers, for policymakers, and for clients, because that's what people care about. That's what people say. People are people really ask, so if I take this, what are my side effects going to be? How do I get it? And so how does that fit into my life? And how well does it work? And so the counterfactual provides that really important information how well it works. I'll tell you, for contraception, it's the same. Contraception, people care about how do I get it? How do I get it? What side effects does it have? How, what, what's the burden on me and the burden, you know, burden, there are daily pill contraceptives. There are things that require little teeny surgery contraceptives and people carry those burdens differently in their heads. Um, and then they ask how well it works. There hasn't been a contraceptive trial against a placebo in as long as any of us have been alive. Um, but people do counterfactuals in the contraceptive world to say, in the absence of this contraceptive, how many pregnancies would there have been? And from that, we can say this contraceptive is this level of protection, and this contraceptive is slightly more, slightly less. And so we can get facile at being able to describe what we learn from the counterfactual and be able to describe that to, our, to each other, to policy folks, and to our clients. Right. And I think it really, like you said, it takes all of us, not just a group of people in a certain specific field, but really people from all over the aisles, whether you're you're in policy or you're in scientific research or, or maybe you're uh, re representing your community. Um, it takes all of us to really develop uh, an effective trial to demonstrate whether a new product is truly better or just as good as old prep or um, old interventions. Um, and so sort of related to that, I was wondering if there are any other questions or issues that should be addressed, um, not only from academia, but perhaps from like other perspectives as well. That's a great question. I, I just want to amplify what you just said. It takes all of us to get to new prep things and then to get them and then to get those new prep um, structures to be able to new prep uh, products to be able to have the impact that we all want. All of us are in this game, not to 
not to figure out whether something works, but to actually have it be workable and eliminating HIV infections out in the world. And that is, everybody's got an equal part to play in that. Everybody, that is, that is community, and that is regulators, and that is academics, and that is companies that make products, and that is, that is uh, normative agencies, and that is, that is the people who volunteer for the trials and the people who, who sign up and, and get a product when it's rolled out into, rolled out into the world. So we're all a part of that, and that's that's it's such a it's such an opportunity. The I think the opportunity is in having these conversations and talking about how exciting it is to keep developing prep options until we've got so many of them that anybody who wants a prep option today or next week here, there, or everywhere on the planet can get it and get it and get it and use it in a way that they don't get HIV. So we've, we as a globe have the a scientific ability to develop a whole suite of PrEP options, enough to, enough to eliminate HIV. We've got to be able to have the conversation to make that happen. I can see it. I can see it on the horizon that we can get to there. We just got to get everybody together to 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 be able to get those products tested and then be able to figure out which ones work, which ones are safe, and then be able to get them out in a way that people can talk about them and embrace them so that they cannot um, so they can stay HIV free. Dr. Jad Beating, professor of Global Health, Epidemiology and Medicine at the University of Washington. Quite intriguing hearing you speak, I must say. Thank you so much for taking your time to join us and have this interview with us.